All right, well, we have another terrific interview for you guys today. Peter Joseph, only the founder of the Zeitgeist Movement, not a big deal. Uh, his first movie was in 2007, Zeitgeist the Movie, which makes sense. Zeitgeist Addendum came out in 2008. Zeitgeist Moving Forward uh, came out in 2011. Peter, thank you for joining us. Oh, appreciate it's my it. pleasure. Pleasure. I really appreciate you having me. All right. Now, a lot of people might not be familiar with the Zeitgeist Movement. Sure. So let's start there. What is it? The Zeitgeist Movement is a global sustainability advocacy group that is essentially orients itself around economic theory and how mm -hmm. we can change the social system to be more pliable, humane, and sustainable across the world. Okay. Uh, so what's wrong with the system we have now? Doesn't it kick ass? <laughs> Aren't we number one? Of course we're number one. Number one in a lot of things, a lot of <laughs> negative things, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of life support systems are in decline. We have growing destabilization across the world. We've watched Occupy come and go. Well, it's still lingering, but in different forms now. We've watched a number of different cr crises emerge. The climate destabilization is still on hand in a very strong way. The central, central argument here, and I'll just jump right into it, is when it comes to economics, which in Greek means management of a household, it also implies efficiency, to economize. You know? mm -hmm. This is a natural order type of system that is natural to the, to the earth, to the environment that we inhabit. Something science stumbled upon, you know, you don't do certain things, you don't pollute the atmosphere with, by burning oil, it creates climate destabilization, we can stick with that example, and extend that on to infinity as far as how we are bound by natural order laws. Nothing metaphysical about that, nothing esoteric. However, what's happened traditionally is we have a, a system, a market-based system, a system that's based on really old traditions of people in, engaging in labor, creating trade. We've developed this thing. We started with handicraft, making it very simple. And we've evolved this industry that is massive, huge money, traveling for the sake of money, money made for the sake of money, I should say. Wall Street, the financial system is bigger than anything, which makes perfect sense since at the core root psychology of this system is this notion of trade only, not social betterment. So to finish my thought, we have these natural law system, this natural law economy, which has been superimposed upon by this capitalist free market system, if you want to call it that in distinction. I use a market, I'm going to say market economy to generalize throughout this conversation. Okay. And what's happened is that they're not in accord with each other. And the problems we're seeing in the world, both on the human level and the ecological level, is this discord. We're taking a square peg and trying to fit it into a round hole. And from here on out, it's only going to get worse across the board. I counter by saying, USA, USA. <laughs> OK, all right. So seriously, why are they in discord? I mean, I think a lot of Americans would normally think, hey, look, capitalism, that's the free market. That's people trading goods mm -hmm. and you know exactly what you described. What's the discord? Well, okay, the psychological value system that underlies it. As I just alluded to, you have Wall Street and the banking system, one of the mm. largest, most uh, influential on uh, growth, GDP in many different ways, the most rewarded system on the planet. This system produces nothing. The Wall Street does nothing. You can argue investment, but creatively, there's no one sitting there behind a desk at a hedge fund putting stuff together to better the world. You could remove, now, you, Peter, could remove the, hold on second, you could remove the entire system of finance and still generate the economy that allows us to live through factory industrial production and creativity. I ask I bring that up because that the core sickness of this is a value system problem. We are we are seeking money and advantage only with the side effect being social betterment whenever it happens. And that's a problem. So now, the bankers would counter, and look, we've got a ton of problems in our banking uh, system, no question about that. But they would say, look, the core of the system is essential because it allocates money and it allocates resources. So if it's more important to society that we create widget X as opposed to widget Y, we move the money in that direction mm -hmm. so that we have more efficiency. So that's something that they do, isn't it? Well, I agree, that to a certain degree. But what is efficiency really on, an, on again, this natural law ecological level? Efficiency means that you want to preserve and you want to do the best thing you can to create the best outcome you can. Efficiency is preservation, conservation to meet needs in the most strategic way. We have an electric car industry that's slowly inching its way into America. What happened to it, say, 100 years ago when the first electric car actually emerged? Why hasn't this technology been completely proliferated around the world? Why? Because industry also is greedy, stubborn, it gets established and doesn't want to change its mechanisms of profit. Across the board, and this is one of the greatest things we talk about in the movement, we are paralyzed by this value ethic. And now I'm not saying that the market system wasn't great a long time ago. In the handicraft industry, we had a simple type of post-feudalism, mercantilism kind of world where people were, everyone was a producer and everyone was trading. That's beautiful in and of itself. The technology and everything that's happened around us 
has completely stifled this to the extent that it's no longer applicable in its merit, and we are evolving out of it. And there's no better word to use than evolution. I don't put down capitalism in the market economy because it was always bad. I say it's no longer relevant, especially in a world where we can create an abundance. But I want to get to the core of the problem. So, you know, I understand that uh, we've got great inefficiencies now. You mentioned the electric car. You know, there's a great movie, Who Killed the Electric Car? And I get why the, co the companies that are in the oil business or that do traditional cars that aren't energy cars want to kill the electric car because they want to protect their market share and they want to kill the trolleys and have everybody drive cars. I understand that. Sure. And they pervert the market in that sense. So, but that's so. But what is the core of that problem that we're letting them? Mm -mm. So, what the is the core it? of the problem? Is that it's not a perversion, as you say. It's, you say it's a perversion. It's not. That is the market. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing that that most economists hate that I say: the market is as free as ever. And economists that are in the free market minds like, whoa, what are you talking about? The economy is not free. We have protectionism. We have trade tariffs. We have all this taxation. We have all this coercion by government. And I say no. Just like feudalism was based on the land, if you go back to feudalism, it's a completely agrarian society. The entire social order was based around production of the land, the lords, nobles, ownership, peasants that controlled it. We went into mercantilism, more state concentration, the ultimate complete state coercion of mercantilism, as I'm sure you know. Capitalism comes in the exact same way, which means that the government and the legislation that's produced by government is a product of the economic theory, not the other way around. So capitalism is the economy. Economy, excuse me, is the government, I meant to say. You can't deviate between the two. So when you see this corruption that people call, it's not corruption, it's the freedom of the market. I have the freedom in the market to shut you down if you have a competing product or if you have something that's gonna interfere with my market share. That is the free market, not this illusion that everyone's gonna compete freely and not have any inhibitions in this sort of utopian laissez-faire thing that goes on in the rhetoric you hear about. So that's trippy and I'm not sure I agree with you. Okay, well. So let's go a little further down the rabbit sure. hole. Sure. Okay. So if you were to take that system away then, well, what's an ideal system? What would replace it? It's an enormous question. Let's look at this from an evolutionary standpoint again. Every element that's happened in human society up until this point in time, excuse me, every social system has been based around scarcity. It's based around the assumption that there really isn't enough to go around, right? You go mm -hmm. back to Adam Smith, you go back to David Ricardo, you go back to Malthus, specifically Malthus, who had population theory, firmly ingrained this stuff. You hear rhetoric uh, across the board from mainstream economists that this is based on the fact that we can't provide enough for everyone, therefore we have to restrict. This is no longer true. When it comes to actual sustainable life supporting goods, when it comes to meeting the needs of the human population, maintaining a high level of public health, and of course assuring sustainability, which you cannot talk about production in any society without talking about sustainability because that's the long term inhibitor when it comes to the laws of nature, we can actually create an abundance now. See, I would argue for the market and all the things that you and many others talk about if I wasn't aware of the fact that it's no longer needed with the, the state of science and technology to alleviate the corruption, you have to get rid of the psychological place of it. You have to, everyone's the same, basically. We're not, some people are not just more corrupt than others, they become that way. There's a reason, just to throw this in there psychologically, that those who have the highest uh, wages in the world donate less to poverty percentage-wise. There was a study done fairly recently that found that the most ruthless and the most wealthy people in the world, excuse me, the most wealthy were the most ruthless. They were most likely to cut people off in traffic. Mm -hmm. And this is all common sense to us. We know that the cutthroat mentality is there. But the point is it's no longer necessary. Do you want to resolve global problems? Do you want to resolve poverty? We can, overnight. Do you want to resolve corruption? Do you want to resolve the fact that, that we have ecological destabilization coming out every single angle with almost every life support in decline? We can, but it, okay. it's going to take overriding the current social system and moving on. I, but I need to know how. Okay. So, so I agree with you that you know, if you breed a certain culture, you will get that culture. So if you uh, reward and incentivize greed, you will get more greed. Yes. Uh, and same with corruption, etc. So I, I don't believe that the way we do things is the only way we can do things. And I, and I believe that there is a better way and we can get there. Now, I need to know more about the specifics though. So for example, if you say, okay, we have enough uh, food to feed the world. That's true, we do. The question is, how do you allocate it? So that's what I throw at you. Well, let's think about allocation. Uh, what is the point of any allocation in a market system? It's to get needs to people, really. It's mm -hmm. something that doesn't really happen. You know, as every major World Health Organization has stated that it's not the food, it's not the nutrients, it's not the calories that's in, in, in a deficit. It's the fact that there's not enough money in these environments for these, these poor people to have resolution. There's not enough money to create the desalinization plants to bring clean water. So the problem is economic. So an allocation, what does it mean? It means meeting the needs of the human population. Why should we give birth to anyone on this planet that we cannot take care of? 
And the fact of the matter is we can. So that's a huge subject. I could go on a massive spiel about how an entirely new social system could be generated that takes in all the needs of the entire human population at once. And probably the first thing that comes out of anyone listening to this will, feel, will be communism, because that's a right. general reaction. But that is not what it is at all. It's actually making a society that isn't an anti-society, which is what we have now. OK, now, I, I believe you when you say it's not communism. And I think it's very simplistic, thing, simplistic to think of it that way. Obviously, you're not in favor of capitalism as the as we have it now right well, um, I'll, I'll say I'm not in favor of this idea that a competitive system where everyone's out for itself is the way that you can have a healthy society okay so I, again I'm trying to wrap my mind around how it would work so okay, sure. okay so it's not like hey you know we've got all the food in the world and hey Bob if you don't want to work take it take a load off and we'll get it to you or whatever it, I'm describing the okay. the stereotype of communism sure, okay sure. so but how does it work? I mean, okay. how, so you would have to reallocate resources to some degree. Wouldn't you have to take more from the rich to be able to feed the people in Africa, et cetera? Well, no, that's another unfortunate straw man that's built up. I'm not accusing you of that, by the way. But mm -hmm. people often say, well, you're just going to take stuff from everybody else. That's not right. Transition to a new social system is, of course, not a, an easy thing to think about. Mm -hmm. And we could talk at length about that. But let me, let's think about it more of a, a direct philosophical, technical level. Mm -hmm. Let's put it in layers. Human needs are human needs, and public health is public health. Public health can be defined as both your nutritional health and also your mental health, your state of mind. The lack of conflict in society is also an attribute of public health and preventive medicine. If you look at this from the standpoint of all the layers that create what your daily life means, begin, begin with food. Food creation can exist in much higher states than they can now, and they can be localized, removing economic consequences that we have of the current market economy, such as globalization, which is very mm. destructive, high energy, completely wasteful, exploiting labor. We can concentrate food production in regionally all across the world in very simple technical manners, such as vertical farms. Vertical farms can be put on the coast of Los Angeles, run with desalinization processes and nutrient extraction processes coming from the ocean, and we can grow hundreds of tons of organic nutrient vegetable food, enough to meet the, the actual in a protein generating food too, you know, all sorts of things that have been grown as well, actually meet the nutrition, high nutritional quality of everyone in Los Angeles. Locally, no importing. Now I'm not advocating that's all we do, but I'm giving you the example. So what that means is that you could have, for example, in transition, and I'm, just, I'm jumping ahead, is all food free in Los Angeles of this nature okay. to everyone, to meet everyone's need, period, because it's in abundance. No one's going to hoard it and steal it, even in a market system, because it's going to go to waste. It's available to everyone, and you would see an enormous increase in public health and less strife in the community. I could go on a big tangent on that, but we'll stop there. Okay, so that's but, one but, layer. But, okay, the people who are going to make that food, they have to be incentivized to make it. They do. Okay, so how do you pay them? How do you incentivize okay, well, in, them to produce more food? In a transitional system, see, I'm speaking transitionally right now, okay. you, would, you would pay them just like anyone else would be paid. You'd subsidize this one. So this mm -hmm. one would be subsidized. Or okay. you get corporate influence to agree to do it, which would be hard to press, hard okay. pressed to do. But yeah, it, you'd have to this, change a lot of things for that to happen. Well, we're talking about changing everything here. So mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm, there's no qualms here. I understand the difficulty of you. I'm not, a, I'm not here to, to say that this is easy, but I'm presenting a train of thought. Okay. And if people want to see these resolutions and they want to have change, we could do it. We are one big human family. Okay, so put the corporations aside. You could subsidize it. Okay. It could be subsidized. But I really don't want to go down this road to talk about this because it's actually deviating from the point as far as it just getting done. You know, the automated food system is what we're talking about. We're talking about one supervisor on every floor of these automated tiered vertical farm systems. Everything can be automated at this stage as far as stuff like that very easily. This is powerful because you have supervisors get paid nominally what in concert as far as the whole industry, excuse me, they get paid perfectly fine if, again, we're talking about a market economy and I usually don't think this way. They can be paid perfectly sufficiently, uh, especially given the fact that there's not a fraction of the employees that would typically be involved in industrial production as we know it today as far as food resources. Again, here's one problem though. I don't want to go this angle because it's really complicated to include the market economy. That's why I advocate the removal of it. Okay, so but let's, if you let's remove the market economy, what, what is do you the incentive? Do? Yeah. What is the incentive? Yes. The incentive is that your well being is directly related to everything that happens. So that means you are incentivized to actually contribute because it comes back to you. In 1992, Gallup poll, 50% of Americans donated 4.2 hours, 4.2 hours totaling 80 billion hours a year. No money, they donated themselves to help poverty, to help different systems. In 1978, there was a study done in Canada, one of the only studies done ever in the world, by the way, and this is fascinating. They gave a fixed guaranteed income to a small town, a brilliant, for four years. Mm -hmm. 
everyone, more people graduated from high school, more people worked, the happiness rate was off the chart, people could take care of their families. These are people that came from more destitute, or in, destitute origins. It was an incredible improvement. So wait, everybody got the same salary? Everyone was given the same monthly rate. Of uh -huh. Salary, yes, and then they could do whatever they wanted. And they 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 kept working. They went to jobs that employed them. This was this is a particularly unique circumstance. I can send you the article if you'd like to read uh -huh. it. But it was, but it, what it goes to show is this incentive fallacy we have that no one's going to do anything unless there's a monetary reward is short sighted. People will do tons of things if they think it comes back and helps them, and even more so, the great secret of humanity: people love to do things that help others. They really do. So you think that they would have started Nike just the same? No. And and would have uh, expanded Nike just the same if they didn't have the profit motive? Because that is a completely different uh, abstract notion that seeks profit. Mike, Nike, th the entire concept of say a shoe has to be put in question. You don't design a shoe to be advertised through celebrities to sell it, to develop market share and a style and a brand. In the future, if we were to move into this type of sanity, people would think of shoes in the most ergonomic sense. It would be designed to last, be decided to be most beneficial and healthy for you. We would lose a lot of the stylistic things. All corporate facades are built upon the interest to sell you things things with a certain degree of durability, with a certain degree of health involved, but, isn't but that that's part secondary. Of, but isn't that part of human nature? People want style. Oh, well, I think style can come in many different ways, though. People can appreciate each other without the, the ornament and all the nonsense. Go back 60 years. Uh, in America, we'd have more or less, uh, let's go back, I'm sorry, go back to about 100 years. In America, we had more of a puritanical ethic for the earliest part of this country. It wasn't until the 19, actually, yeah, I think about 1930s, that the big push towards two phenomena in effect. Planned obsolescence because our technology was getting too big, so we had to re decrease product life in order to keep the consumption economy going, keep people employed. And two, this massive thing put forward by people like Eddie Bernays and a lot of others, that they wanted to turn people into consumers because not of what they needed, because of these wants that would be generated by society. This is fact, anyone can go look this up. So the value system that is talked about where people, you have this assumption that people just want more and more and more bling and they want to be stylized. There might be some truth to that. We see African countries with their ornaments and everything, but that is very, very different from what's been put forward in the fashion neuroses that has come to define our culture today in America and the West. So I, I guess I have a fundamental problem with that because I think that the, I, and you know, balance is a kind of a loaded word, but I, I, I think that I look at it a little bit more balanced that I think that human beings are both things. They are both incredibly cooperative and much more so than is in our current system uh, allows for or encourages. I agree. But at the same time, I also believe they're incredibly competitive. And so, so I think they want the bling. I think it's a natural human instinct and they want more land and they want more stuff. And I think trying to bottle that up Ain't gonna work. Okay, well, I, I, instead of us thinking anecdotally, anecdotally or at a surface sense, let's run to statistics. Mm -hmm. There are many, many studies that have been done by the Khan Academy and many other places that have done numerous research projects as to, to see what really motivates people and what happens when they get put into certain environments where they're forced to be competitive. When it comes to collaborative things, excuse me, when it comes to creative ventures, and I find this to be particularly interesting, Competition is not a good concept. Cutthroat con competition is not a good concept at all when it comes to developmental creativity. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look, this is easy to prove if you look at a general corporation. While all corporations might be fighting ruthlessly against each other, there's a deep-seated need to incentivize some element of deep collaboration amongst those that are working together in mm -hmm. the, to produce what they need to produce. I think that there's a great deal of truth to what you say, but I think it's over-exaggerated to a large degree. I think that the core of everything is a collaborative drive, a deep empathy. You know, when you walk down the street, you see someone get hit by a car, you want to help them. You don't want to laugh at them and, you know, it's just, you deeply, we have an empathetic evolutionary psychology that's been suppressed. And I use that word suppressed very, very adamantly. I think if we were given time to, f to fruit out a non-competitive environment to really see that collaboration is the most rewarding. And it's not to say we're all equal, it's to say that yes, you contribute because your skill set is really good in one way, I contribute because my skill set is really good in another way, and we work together to make the best of it, not have a cutthroat personality okay, battle so because we think that one needs to be better than the other in this value system we have. Y you know, again, I, we have some disagreement on that because I just think that uh, you're right that it's been de-emphasized and, and we're on the extreme end of the spectrum and we can come much closer to the, to the middle. But I also think that, that 
I, I, okay. Maybe I'm overgeneralizing based on myself, but I'm an incredibly competitive guy. I want to win, right? I, I, I want to win in a basketball game. I want to get the hotter girl. I, you know, I want. I was born into a deeply competitive musical environment. Everyone was as cutthroat as can be. I have deep neurological combinations of competition myself, but I understand where they come from. Mm -hmm. Competition is, again, a cultural phenomenon. We have a fight or flight propensity. We get, we run out of food, we get and do, I step on your foot, you're really mad at me, your adrenaline kicks in. A competitive mode might, might happen, there might be conflict. But in, in the society that can create an abundance, we have to really think about what it means for us to meet the needs and change our evolution, our evolutionary psychology, if you will. I mean that, not in a literal sense. We look at the fact that over the fourth, past 4,000 years, the dramatic changes that have heard, occurred through society, mm -hmm. that's all cultural. Our brains have not changed that dramatically in 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. And I'll say this as one final point, as these little tangents I have, is uh, war. We live in a state of very, very detrimental war technology. Nanotechnology, of course, nuclear weapons. I mean, in about 50 years, we're going to have nanotechnology, if not a lot sooner, that will make the, the, uh, ro the nuclear bomb look like a Roman catapult. It's that severe when we think of national war to see what kind of risk we're all at when anyone will at this point be able to get a suitcase bomb to blow something out. Anyone will be able to do anything to have enormous capacities of destruction. So. Point being, I agree that com competition can be good, sports, friendly competition, but on, a, on the social level, it's truly destructive and could very well lead to the demise of the whole society. Well, there actually we, we generally agree. I mean, so I, I think, for example, we've incentivized uh, defense contractors in this country to make more money if there's more war. And then we told them, oh, by the way, it's incredibly easy to buy our politicians. Yep. So you put a, either a plant in their district or just simply give them ten or $50,000. If My God, if you gave them $50,000, they'll do anything for you, right? Sure, sure. And so we've created this giant incentive system for more war. Yes. And then, and by the way, we're number one in USA, USA, and we're going to dominate. And when we do, we're shocked to find out that other people are displeased with that. Yeah. And then they, and then there's something called blowback. Yeah. You know, libertarians talk about this, liberals talk about it, and and so well, all of that I totally agree with, right? And okay. and I want to change that system. I'm just trying to find a way well, that I can wrap my mind around it where I think that it's, to be honest, realistic. Okay. Well, I'll do you one further then, just for the philosophical basis of it. Okay. With, with, with respect to war, um, there's a deep intermeshing between politics, business, and war, and there always has been. Again, the government we have is a product of the competitive market economy, not the other way around. So to think that we would not go to war for oil, we would not go to war to sec secure our currency, to think that we would not go to war to do all of these things that we've been doing, in fact, all empires have been doing, East India Company, Britain, war has always been about resources and economic commercial domination. Always, with a few religious exceptions in the Middle Ages. And even those, actually, if you look underneath the surface, are largely about trade and commerce and land. That is deeply ingrained in the competitive market mentality. If you have two corporations that are seeking market share, looking to collaborate, get cartels going, looking to establish monopoly, yeah, they might get, not be able to get away with it too long because of the overarching government issue that's there to stop it. There's no real difference between that than two countries, which are corporations, one and all. The United States gets trillions of dollars in tax revenue from all corporations. It's a business, period. General Smedley D. Butler, 1940s, one of the most decorated army officers in the history of America. He wrote a book called War is a Racket, and I've never seen a more plain description of how war is and has always been used for commercial domination of the monetary power, which is why we always put down the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and all these people we demonize. They are just manifestations of the same ruling ethic. So to, to dis dif disagree a little bit, I don't differentiate. I see it as exactly built in, and we can expect nothing less than the buying of politicians, the defense contract, windfalls, these are all built into the same mechanism as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so how do you change it? Okay. How do you change a system that is inherently corrupt? How do you change a system move from something where everyone has been so deeply conditioned into these values and ethics to the fact that it's glamorized now into something that is actually sustainable in meeting the needs of the human population in an abundance? Transition, again, is the most complicated thing you can talk about. But you have to change, which is what the Zeitgeist Movement does, the value systems first. You have to get people to realize the underlying problem and get them to actually understand the solution. So when you talk about change, literally, it's a change of the human being. It's a change of you and I. To realize that we might be a part of this system, we might have to engage it. I have to sell movies, I have to engage in the evil capitalist stuff, and everyone says I'm a hypocrite for that. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's me living in the system I was born into, trying to work through it. 
We have to deviate and create plans to enable an abundance, to enable these, these elements that would comprise the characteristics of the new social system in the future, which would, again, reward these, these attributes. The Zeitgeist Movement works about four different levels here. We have, for example, on March 17th, we have a big aware, awareness day that's global. We have about 150 events, usually on average for this day, across the world in at least about 70 countries. And it's all about showing the flaws of the current economic system and showing the solution through the train of thought of logic, natural law economy that we put forward. And you guys get drunk for St. Patrick's Day. Yes, of course. Okay, all right, good. All right. So I want to be clear on that. Yeah, it's at the same time, but uh, right. we can't talk about that. Okay, all right. This is a coincidence. All right. So, and Beyond the second that, event is on Cinco de Mayo. No, okay, all right, go ahead. <laughs> the, uh, the other issue is to show the world, again, the possibility more than anything else. We can talk about and complain, and most people know the complaints. They don't know the root order, the root, excuse me, the root psychology, the root problem of this system. They don't fully understand that, which, again, I can talk about to my, till I turn blue. But to show people what's possible and make them realize that they don't have to exist the way they do. And if they realize that, just as you know, slavery, when the you know, African-American population, many of them probably thought that's the way it was supposed to be. They were ingrained into that, to be slaves. That was their value system. They thought God created them this way or something like that. Slowly they realized it didn't have to be that way. And revolution occurred and they were set free, if you use that terminology. This can happen the exact same way. We can free ourselves from this economic system if we change our minds and start to create institutions that interfere with the system a little bit, mm -hmm. in meaning that there are transitional systems that can be put forward that don't use money. There could be transitional systems that put forward that use a mutual credit system that removes the pressure of GDP. Again, these are all transitional notions I could talk at length. But I really want to emphasize, because I, I could go a long distance on this, for the audience's sake, which probably doesn't even know what I'm referring to, I'd like to talk about what actually comprises the new system, because mm -hmm. you've alluded to it, but we haven't really described it. Okay. So let's think about this in layers. Public health is really the goal, of, it's the success of society is public health, right? It doesn't matter how much stuff we have. Even mm -hmm. if everyone in the world had a 50-room mansion and two jets parked in the front lawn, that doesn't mean they're happy. Mm -hmm. But it would be kind of awesome. <laughs> it would be pretty <laughs> trippy if that was the case. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, granted, the earth couldn't sustain that, clearly. Right. Uh, but We're working on it. And that's another important <laughs> point, is that all elements about our sense of luxury and a aspirations and success have to fit within the pre-existing framework of the natural order. Mm -hmm. People often say to me, well, if, what if I want in your system a, a, you know, a huge 2,000 square foot uh, house with, that's not 2,000 square foot house, a 200 square mile backyard, I should say, something yeah. obnoxious. I say, right. oh yeah, well, what if I want Africa as my backyard? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's humane? Because at some point, when it comes to the natural balance of society, some things become crazy, irrational, and essentially violent. There's a great deal of material violence out there with it comes to, when it comes to selfishness. So with that framework in mind, you have to balance human needs and our aspirations and sense of success and material abundance with the, the inherent levels of restriction in the natural world, the carrying capacity of the earth. We want to coexist or do we want to fight? If we want to coexist, then we have to change our patterns. Seven billion people on this planet, nine billion people in a couple of decades, easy. Uh, that's due to lack of education, by the way. Uh, we are going to have to really assess what we're doing and build a model around that goal. Now, that's the first thing. How do you establish that goal? Do we want that goal? If humanity doesn't want that goal, then there's no hope in even trying to, trying to reach it. But I think deep down, people want to see balance and peace and sustainability. So you start with the food level, as I mentioned earlier. Easy to create global abundance through localization. Energy, big energy issue across the world. Are there other technical solutions to create energy abundance? Absolutely. There's more energy hitting the surface of the earth uh, every day than we could use daily for 4,000 years. There's, it's 4,000 times more energy. It's a technological capacity to harness, which, harness it, which is right around the corner with nanotechnology. Also geothermal and wind and solar and tide. These have immense capacity. There's no energy crisis. We localize all of that. All homes become local in their energy production. Very easy to do at this point in time. It's not done because of, again, the utility industry and the cartels that are inherent to our system. And the GDP that it drives, by the way. That's very important to point out. You localize this, boom. Everyone has food and everyone has energy. Now we get to production. Now, I make it oversimplified, but it really is that simple if these industries were set up. If these mechanisms, I say industry, I mean technical mechanisms were set up. Then you move on to actual production. Production is really important, and of course this relates to what I just described. Production, you have to get a sense of what the Earth has. Right now, all the corporations in the world that hoard resources for their own profit gain, they keep it secret what's available. We don't really know how much oil there is. We don't really know how many diamonds or how much copper or how much aluminum there really is. There have been surveys that have been made, but it's, it's private secrets. It's the corporate right to have those secrets. We have to assess this, and we have to figure out exactly what we have. 
And then we have to generate a system, a logical system, of distributing these resources in a way that actually make sense with respect to natural law. What I mean by that? We have decision-making processes through industry that's based entirely on the motivation of money. So you have to make something. You're looking at numbers and cost efficiency. You're relating to industries. You're going to use things based only on your cost efficiency and the patterns you need. Uh, that's not the way a real economy would work. Real economy would take resources that we have and assess them for their scientific le relevance, assess them for what they're actually supposed to do, what their highest but efficacy is. But who does is. the assessment? The assessment is done by reason, and this is something that people hate it when I say it, because they think that somebody in some round table in some Soviet circle uh -huh. is going to make all the decisions for all the world. One of the great psychological revolutions, great sociological revolutions that has to occur if we intend to survive on this planet is we have to stop delegating decision making to people and delegating decision making to a process of rational thought and logic. This is completely devoid in the world. Let me, let me, let me express this, because I know it's a difficult thing to just throw out there. We can calculate society now. Science has only been with us really in application for about 600 years. We can calculate what the greatest conductor of conducting metal is and why it should be used in certain forms and not in others. We can apply this type of reasoning to everything. And I don't mean some utopianistic thing where suddenly there's a matrix and everything's ca calculated. That's an ideal. That probably isn't reality, at least not now. But that's the way we should approach our thought process. We have to arrive at conclusions, not base them on traditional notions or pre-existing systems. So when you take that frame of reference, it completely shatters the political system. It shatters the business system, as we know it. It shatters this notion of free choice. And I say that in a very subtle way, because when it comes down to it, we are not free. If we intend to survive on this planet, we have to align ourselves with the laws of nature and guide ourselves, and that's that. And that's a deep problem we have with the neuroses of freedom we have in the world today. But, but Peter, it comes back to who's going to make that decision. Yes. So, like, I, I sometimes kiddingly, somewhat kiddingly, uh, call myself on the show the most reasonable man in America. Okay. okay so, do I get to make the decisions? You, every, here, okay, here's the democracy. Okay. What is the root of democracy? Democracy means, at the root, I don't mean a Greek root, but democracy in and of itself implies a finding a way to get people to work together and share the world and share decision-making processes, right? Right. Yep. Okay, well, a democracy could be that everyone in the world decides to kill themselves. Well, then that's their choice to do so. Yep. It could be that everyone in the world decides to enslave a whole group of people. That's fine. It could be decided that everyone in the world, in their ignorance, decides to destroy the whole planet because of bad methods, because they're not willing to align themselves with natural laws, such as, say, climate destabilization, depletion, all the other things that are happening in the world today. So that means democracy needs something else. It needs a guiding, a guiding educational principle. It needs a frame of reference to make the democratic process reasonable because otherwise it's just monkeys in the wild. Okay, but who gives it that? Well, like I'm, your I'm reason can be, can be different than my reason. And you know, look, I, I'm an but enormous believer in logic and, I, sure. and I'm agnostic and I don't believe in religion. That's a whole separate problem because we've got to overcome the fact that the world is Massively religious. And that's a great cetera, point, right? As far but, as but who decides what's reasonable? Well, let me let me finish my point. Is we have to create a system of interaction of humanity, where everyone decides. Mm -hmm. Now, what I mean by that is we have we with this thing called a, a, a direct democracy is very common now. It's mm -hmm. it's used in technical circles. Mm -hmm. We apply the concept of direct direct democracy, except it isn't people seeing a referendum. It isn't people voting on something. It's actually about the true established element of society that keeps us going, which is industry itself, not politics. Politics is a, is a byproduct. It's, it's really, at its deepest core, it's really a, a negative retroaction of, a, of an economic system that's so inefficient, it needs these people up here to control everything in their dictatorial way. So in a future, you're gonna have an interactive system of some kind where people are gonna to contribute to the development of goods, of life support. They're gonna to contribute to the management of the earth, contribute to their own betterment in just the way we do today, except against a technical benchmark of scientific, the scientific method and reason. We really can't operate any other way. Well, there's gotta be a system, and it can be done technically, it can be done through computers, it can be done, I mean, there's plenty, that's how direct democracy is proposed to work today. I use that, it's a great analogy. It can be done where people are interacting and sharing ideas in an utterly open source way. Oh, you want to build a car? Here's a bunch of data that we've comprised about how this car could work more efficiently and more in the interest of our demands and the population. But what if I don't want your perfectly efficient car? Well, when it's going to get to a point also when human choice 
will be so much more variable because of the modular revolution in robotics where you will be able to print cars in a way where you can have a custom car at a whim without the need for mass production. There are so many things that are happening technologically right now that aid the individualism that you speak of, the, the ability to be, you to be creative in and of yourself, 3D printing. Uh, there's a whole lot of amazing stuff happening around the corner. If you study people like Ray Kurzweil, the Singularity Institute, go back and look at people like Jock Fresco, Buckminster okay. Fuller. These are, I, I throw this out there because we're not thinking wide enough. And I'm calling you out a little bit just because you've got to be wider. You've mm. got to look at what's possible. Pretty and wide. Then, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at what's possible and thinking about how a lot of the fears that we have about a loss of individuality, a loss of decision making are not actually applicable to the type of system of interaction I'm speaking of. And I'll say one I'm more final. Sure, I'm not sure I'm buying that. Okay. Well, because what's what's like, the objection? I mean, look, it, again, I, I, I'm not quite sure who's making the decision. It, it seems a little too Let me reiterate. utopian about how we all wind up agreeing on the right technical things. See, and, then, and then what's my parameters of choice? You know, it, so like you've come up with this great car, except then I say, okay, but I want a different car. And then you say, don't worry about it because all the printers are going to print all the kind of cars you want. Well, let me ask you this one. How much choice do you think you really have? How much choice do any of you people think you really have in a world that's driven entirely by a corporate incentive, entirely upon mass production in a very inefficient way, producing things that, yeah, there's the illusion of difference. Everything is as, as 1984 as you po could possibly imagine in the world today. Everything is carbon copy. Look at the average homes out there. There's very little variation. The entire infrastructure is certainly without variation. People have very little options to do tons and tons of things. I can't put solar panels on my home without an enormous amount of money. There's an inhibitions across the board. So this idea, this, you know, this sort of indulgence that we have that we can exist in a way, we, we can't exist in a way, excuse me, without the market system, because the market system enables this freedom of choice is really a delusion. It's, we have limited choices more than any time uh, than we'll ever see when it comes to the future. There'll be so many more choices in the future. And there's only one final thing I'll add to that that is really important, again, I can't drill home enough, enough is that when we want to be sustainable, our choices are limited. And it doesn't mean that things are going to be uh, anything less than they are now. In fact, there'll be more choices in the future. But the, the but if the choices are limited, who's the one who gets the limit? Well, we, it's funny how, again, we think we live in a democracy, and you keep asking me this question, who is the person? You don't fathom that we can create a system where everyone interacts through a, a medium that reasons these things out, where production can be but automated. But, okay, so that gets back to my religion point, then. So, no, I, I, it is hard to fathom, right? Okay. right. So, I, I fancy myself logical, right? And... Uh, at the same time, I know that I live in an ocean of insanity. Let's keep it real. Okay. Generated insanity. Okay. Now, so there's the insanity that you talk about in the capitalist system, et cetera, which I large, which there's a lot that I agree with on, on sure. as we've discussed already. And then there's the insanity of religion. So if we went to, uh, you know, we go to decide what's reasonable, and people will decide sure. that w what's reasonable is we're going to get sucked so, up into the sky by Jesus' vacuum. Believe me, I, I, I know, I, I'm not sitting here trying to tell you I have all the answers. Uh -huh. I'm trying to present a train of thought to the audience and yourself to the extent that this is what we could do. This will resolve the problems at hand. We have plenty of cognitive dissonance. I have spent a great deal of time criticizing religious belief. I'm very well aware of the neuroses that's established. I'm also very well aware of the dogma that exists in the, the, the market mindset too with people I speak of, this materialism that's come forward. Where anything, where you try to say anything about how things, how things should be, or how you want to, you know, how someone should behave. They, everyone hates that. I know. Mm -hmm. I get that. But the fact of the matter is, there is a governing natural law. I am susceptible to certain rules. I could eat tons of garbage and toxic stuff, but I'm going to get cancer probably. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm bound if I want to maintain health. Same thing goes for society. If we want to live in a society that's peaceful, sustainable, humane, in a very, very literal sense that we know of today, we have to take the social order into account. So people's values have to be adapted to what works on the whole. Mm -hmm. And if you follow mm -hmm. this train of thought, okay. you will realize that that. And we are malleable. We are very malleable. We, our, our plasticity in our minds can enable us to do things. I mean, you look across the world, there are people living in all sorts of different types of societies, not as much as there used to be, of course, mm -hmm. with the, the hegemonic agendas of the West. But right. it's not that it's, it can't be done. It's not that people, people will overcome their fears once they realize that they are going to be so much happier than the world they have today, because this is all relative as well. I'm not trying so, to say this is utopia. This is relative to where we are now. So you, look, there's limited resources, and that's a sad day for all of us, and we allocate them in a way that's not necessarily efficient now, so we have the uh, illusion of choice, as you're pointing out. I get all that, right? Uh, in your view of things, somebody, it, 
there's going to be another system of making those the choice among limited resources, right? Well, now, and yeah. then, and you're hoping that it's a, one that is based on reason. Okay, so that appeals to me. I like reason, okay, right? right? But when we go to decide together, we're not very reasonable creatures. <laughs> so, no, yeah. okay, so I mean, we're not right now. I hope we are in a thousand mean. years and a ten thousand years. I know what you mean. But right now, like, you go try to make a reasonable decision in Pakistan and see how that turns out for Wait, you. I, I, I completely agree with you. I understand. Okay. Like, once again, I'm not trying to d deny that. And I, I know that there would be an enormous amount of resistance towards anything of this nature, regardless of how reasoned, and even if you explained how beneficial it would be for everyone, especially in these impoverished, highly religious nations, how much better their lives would be if they simply conceded to these fundamental economic purposes. Uh, but that doesn't change the goal. And that doesn't mean if it doesn't happen tomorrow, it doesn't happen in a decade, it doesn't happen a hundred years, it doesn't happen a thousand years from now, it doesn't change the interest to pursue it. Because if you follow the logic, this is where we're going. And I think it will happen if we don't destroy each other, each other and the planet uh, beforehand. And that's nip and tuck as to which way it's going to go. Sure. So one more thing. Uh, how do people take concrete steps now? Let's assume that you, know, you live in a Western democracy. Specifically, I would say the U.S. We're in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want them to take certain action in terms of the government and say, okay, let's do this instead of that? Okay, um, as far as transition, I'll jump right into that. Um, the first, as I mentioned earlier, is you have to really start to inform people about what the true root problem is. Again, I have huge lectures and tons of documents on the root problems of economics as we know it. Then you have to inform them of the solution, get that under their belts. Then you show them what's possible. You show them they can live in a world where they only work two hours a week. You show them that these... Oh, they, get at it. Uh, Adam, you, tell, listen, <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> uh, you, I'm dead serious. You've, I don't think you understand the capacity of what we're capable of technologically. This isn't to say we're going to live in the same world we live in now. Mm -hmm. I'll tell, well, I'll, I'll, we'll take this back right now. Then. Imagine if you took all the technology that you know of today, all the automation stuff, and uh -huh. you imposed it on America, or you imposed it on Europe uh, 300 years ago. Forget the biases of the culture, forget mm -hmm. everything. They would not have to work at all. You know why? Because it will be fully and utterly automated. It's the change of culture, the change of the notion of materialism that has forced us into wanting more and more and creates these illusions. I'm not saying that we should go back to 300 years you know, Europe. That's mm -hmm. all I'm saying. I'm saying is that it's success. Yeah, they didn't have air conditioning back then, no. so let's just keep that it's real. It's okay. all relative. Okay. The values are all relative. If we leave this materialistic culture, if we stop this obsession with consumption that has been imposed upon us, we could find balance to an extent where we drive our values and importance from how we relate to each other, how we help, how we contribute to the world, how we better ourselves in a deep personal way, not how many cars we have in the garage or anything right. else. I mean, look, it, it, two hours a week seems extreme to me, but I understand your overall Well, I point. can mathematically quali quantify that in documents that have been posted. Uh, I understand. So, <laughs> but, so, now that's step three. Well, let's, let's, go back, let's go back so to my like, point. But, okay, then what do we so do what do tomorrow? We do? So what I, I propose, we have a great deal of, of poverty, we have a great deal of unemployment, and unemployment, by the way, just to make sure that this is stated at least once, unemployment is a consequence of technology entirely. The entire reason we have unemployment in America and across the world is in explicitly based on the application of technology for cost efficiency, and this is not going to stop. And this will lead to what has been called by theorists the contradiction of capitalism to the ultimate instability of our social system. The ability to produce more with less people at cheaper rates, it's a complete clash of the system. That being said, there's plenty of people unemployed on this, on this planet that, could, that have plenty of skills that could be utilized. There's something called a mutual credit system that has been used in Switzerland. It also takes more primitive forms as a time bank uh, in the world, like in New York they have one, I think there's one probably in Los Angeles. And what you do is you don't use money. You start to barter through these complex systems, computerized systems, you barter services and even goods in certain circumstances. You're not using money, which is beautiful. You're, doing, you're accomplishing two things. You're removing growth, which means you're removing circulation, which is a negative thing against this type of, this type of model. You want more and more consumption to make this model work, which means that, in, it, this isn't the intention of it, but as long as people are bartering and getting their needs met because they have no money, and the, those that do come around and want to do that instead because they despise the system, like myself, they will start to pull away from the market economy, and they will start to pull more gas out of this. We're going to starve the beast.
Mm -hmm. Star of the Beast is a more a, a firmly activist notion. Second are sharing systems. There's a Zeitgeist movement in Toronto that does a tool sharing system. In their local community, they have all their tools put in one place and they share them. Why? Because no one uses a screwdriver all the time. So they share them. No one, there's no dupli duplication of stuff. Like the Zipcar. Zipcar is a tremendous good, good uh, sustainability at practice thing because it's not people buying cars one-on-one. -on -one. They're using them, having access to them. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing about the future. There won't be as much property obsession in the future. It'll be about access more than anything else. Extremely important for sustainability of the species given population growth. All right. So that's, those are two attributes that will help pull some wind out of this system and help those that are really suffering. And then we move on to larger order mandates that will move against the government to demand certain facilities be put in place regarding energy, regarding food production, and this, this word that people hate more than anything else, the socialization of certain aspects of our lives. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. advocated a guaranteed income. And he was killed soon after. I'm not saying that was why. But mm -hmm. he, w he went against the economic system just like he went against racism. You know why? Because we live in a state of pure economic racism. It takes the form of classism now. It doesn't matter what your, if your, your gender or race is. It matters what your place is and the social hierarchy. And they're going to keep you in those positions because it's subservience oriented, it's exploitation across the board. This is important. So these mandates will be pushed forward in the same type of rhetoric. And through a combination of these things, and the ultimate issue really is education, I believe that there's going to be a breakdown in combination as well, because this system is not going to survive. I mean, we're going to keep, you're, mark my words, you're going to see more unemployment, so it's inevitable. You're going to see more poverty of the ultimate tier. More employment or unemployment? Unemployment, unemployment. excuse me. Right. Uh, you're going to see more climate destabilization, because the faster this system pulls itself and tightens the noose, the corporations are going to get more and more lax and more and more ruthless. Mm -hmm. Same with the politicians. And the worst thing that I fear more than anything else is another world war, which has been inching in certain ways for a long time. There's a lot I agree with uh, in what you just described. Okay, before we leave, though, I, sure. I want to ask you about how you got here. Oh. So w where did you grow up, and how did all of this come about? Sure, I, I grew up in North Carolina, a, a small a small, more or less an urban town, but for North Carolina it isn't particularly urban. Uh, my father is a mailman and my mother, well they're retired now, is a social worker. And I actually I pull a lot of my views from my mother's work in social work. She worked many different elements, uh, but I've never seen such deprivation in the more rural areas of the world. A, a really a case example of what poverty does to people in the generation of neuroses, sexual abuse, gangs. Uh, it's really a, a, a microcosm, uh, I should say a macrocosm really, of what's happening across the world. Um, and I drew a lot of values from that, but I grew up in a very competitive environment. I was in pursuing a career in classical music. Uh, that was my, mm -hmm. went to college for, I dropped out for various uh, obvious reasons, debt. I didn't want, I couldn't see myself going into $100,000 in debt to be a musician. That made no sense to me. Mm -hmm. It's unique how the uh, financial system when people turn uh, 18, they go to college and they are just ripe to be exploited by the corporations because they're going to walk out of that school with enormous amounts of debt, at least in America. And then you're going to have to pay that off the rest of your life. Who are you going to pay it off? What you, or how are you going to pay it off? You're going to work for a corporation. Yeah. And uh, you can't leave, otherwise you can't pay the debt. Yeah. And the debt, so uh, education is the one thing you cannot get rid of even under bankruptcy. I know. I remember uh, years ago I was in a default on my loans. It was so big, but it was in my mother's name and they told her they would garnish her social security. Mm -hmm. which I thought was unbelievable. Yeah. And this is America, you know. So I moved, uh, I was in New York for many years. Uh, as of three years ago, I moved here, but I, I mainly worked in media in New York. I, had to, I did my music stuff, but I was just like anyone else. I was very ruthless. I actually was an independent equity trader for about six years. So oh, really? Yeah. I have a lot of experience in the financial system uh, and the advertising system, two of the, in my, my view, two of the worst <laughs> industries on the face of the earth. Did you make good money doing that? Not particularly, because I didn't have a large capital base. Okay. Uh, you have to have high five figures to, to do the type of day trading I was doing. I did nominal, but I didn't, I didn't, I just purely private. Mm -hmm. I didn't work for any institution. Mm -hmm. So, but it, made, it was a great experience driver. I mean, I, it was, I, my goal was to actually do that and be a musician and all my narcissism was to be an equity trader, finally get the capital base, which I was working up to and be a, be a musician. This is the standard kind of narcissism you see in this culture. Then something snapped. Mm -hmm. Something snapped when I was about 25. And I just started looking at the world. 9-11 happened. I started looking at the world. It's like, what's going on? What is, what is, it's like a, I woke up, if to use that cliche term. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then I made uh, this first film as a performance piece, believe it or not, in 2007 as a catharsis. I was still working in advertising, still doing day trading. And I released this free piece. I never intended to put it on, excuse me, I never intended to make a movie out of it. It was uh, riddled with copyright infringement. But I did, a <laughs> I did a performance of it in lower Manhattan for free. And after it was done, I threw the, the media on it, because it was a performance piece. I literally performed the piece mm -hmm. uh, with a percussion uh, arrangement. 
And then I threw it up online, and out of nowhere, the whole thing went viral like there was no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then this started me on a path. I've been pushed into the position I'm in now. I had no mm -hmm. intention of uh, really attempting any of this, and everything's just been led to another, and now I feel a deep, uh, I, I can't live with myself knowing what's possible in the world and seeing what we're doing and without trying to change it. That's mm. where I stand. All right, Peter Joseph, thank you so much oh, for joining you. us on The Young Turks. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah.